This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show, and this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, Night of the Living Dead celebrates its 50th anniversary this year. And um, anybody that... uh, heard my show in January knows I have interviewed the widow of the late great George A. Romero. Suzanne came on here and tonight I have the female lead of the movie. Yes, we have Barbara herself, Judith O'Day. How do you do, Judith? Hello, I'm so pleased to be with you, Greg. Oh, this is this is just an honor, you know. Like that movie was before my time by four years. <laughs> I was born in 1972, so. But I believe you're 39. I believe. <laughs> I'm I'm still holding on to 39, just like Jack Benny did. <laughs> <laughs> but I know a lot of listeners have no idea who Jack Benny is. I know who Jack Benny is. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Wow. You know, this is going to be a big question to start off, but how does that feel 50 years, Night of the Living Dead? Sometimes it's hard to put my hands around. When we made the film way, way back then in 1967, none of us ever had an inkling uh, that Night of the Living Dead would have such longevity. As the decades have gone by, we've been able to talk to so many wonderful fans who have supported our little film. It it makes me feel a tremendous sense of awe, and you know what? A tremendous sense of respect for so many people who have felt found, saw something in our film that has touched them over these decades. Uh, I'm just, I'm so grateful. Yes. Well, before I did this interview, the other day I sat down and watched Night of the Living Dead to get caught up on things. And uh, I'm going to tell you, that movie uh, still looks great. That's nice. Uh, The picture looks nice. Uh, Definitely the, the... the uh, disc or the Blu-ray or the the transfers they do to these movies make it look even sharper, and it just looks so stunning, you know, today. Let me add something to that. You said the Mm Blu-ray. I am not sure if you saw the restored Museum of Modern Art out of New York, the restored version of Night of the Living Dead, which is 4K... It is the most pristine copy you could ever see. Oh. You've got to take a look at that. It was, it's just been released by Criterion on oh. February 13th. Blu-ray, DVD. I have yet to see it. I can hardly wait to see the restored version. I'm told that it is beyond anything that I can imagine. I'm, I'm glad you've seen it, but down the line, take a look at the new Blu-ray that MoMA has produced out of Criterion. Criterion, and Criterion does a really great product. I've got a lot of films on Criteria. You're right. Criterion is right at the top of the list for producing copies and whatnot of some of the finest films ever made. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, I was watching you, and of course, you're. Everybody remembers that infinite line. We're coming to get. They're coming to get you, Barbara. I suppose you probably still get that to this day, huh? I get it practically every day, Greg. I love hearing it. <laughs> well, I need to go into your background a little bit. How how did you land the role of Barbara? Was it just a standard edition? Actually, who you know in this business really does make a difference very, very often. What happened for me is back in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 
I began my professional theatrical career at the age of 15 at the Pittsburgh Playhouse. I auditioned and ended up doing musicals all through my high school years. I worked every night, come back home from school, go to the theater at night. At, um, during that time, I expanded that career from musical theater into television variety shows, radio and television commercial work, voiceover work. Doing that introduced me to a fellow named Carl Hardman. Does that ring a bell with you? I uh, what did you say his name was again? Carl Carl Hardman played Harry Cooper in Night of the Living Dead. Oh, Harry. Okay, he was all the right. Who said, you know, the safest place is the basement and everybody thought he was nuts. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. He was kind of the antagonist in many ways. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, Carl Hardman and Marilyn Eastman who played his wife in the movie, mm -hmm. at the time I was beginning my career, had a recording studio called Hardman Associates back in Pittsburgh. They did all kinds of commercial recordings for the various companies in Pittsburgh. I did a lot of work for them. I met them both. Of course, we struck up wonderful friendships. and. When I left Pittsburgh to go to Hollywood to make a big in film, who should give me a call but Carl Hardman? Barely a year uh, out of Pittsburgh, he said to me, George Romero, Russ Reiner, Jack Russo, and I are going to make a film. Would you like to come back home and audition? I said, sure. At that time, I was, what, 22, 23 years old. I was so thrilled at the prospect of coming home to Pittsburgh to audition for what would be my first full-length feature film. I said to Carl, I'll be on the next plane. I flew home, auditioned for George Romero. I'm not sure if Carl was there. I'm sure Russ or Jack might have been there, but... That audition got me the role of Barbara in Night of the Living Dead. Oh, wow. I loved your hair in the movie. <laughs> you do. That is, there's a story behind that, Greg. You know that. Okay, yeah. Let's, let us hear. All right. I'm pretty much a short-haired gal. I had short hair when I auditioned, when we were filming, uh, or before we started filming, George wanted to see me with longer hair. They got a fall. I came in, cried on the fall, and the fall, if, if you know, the women know what I'm talking about, I don't know if you guys do, but <laughs> uh, a fall is not quite a wig. It's uh, long hair that's attached, in my case, it, would, it was attached to a black band that I attached to my head. What you saw at the very front of my head, just in front of that band, was my real hair. When okay. I put on that fall for the first time, George said, that's great, well, let's use it. He said, well, we'll just dye your hair to match the fall. <laughs> and I looked at him in all my 22-year-old arrogance and said, no, we'll dye the fall to match my hair. <laughs> That's what they did. They dyed the fall to match my hair, which I think was a little bit lighter. I'm not sure what it was, but it was sure different <laughs> than the fall was when I initially tried it on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it struck up the Midnight movie. I, I got to say, I love the Midnight audience probably the best of all movie audiences because they're the people that show up that really are devoted to a, to said film and they know all the lines and they they really make this the experience uh, so much better. Um, so that is definitely something that came up with Night of the Living Dead since its release in 1968. 
Uh, you're absolutely right. I don't believe there is a fan in the world as supportive and as loyal as horror fans. When they love you, they love you forever. Yes, they do. And, uh, of course, uh, George A. Romero, unfortunately, is uh, gone. But, uh, like I said, I was at, I was invited by a Canadian actress uh, to go to Horrorama last year. And uh, it's the first time I've been out in New Brunswick, Canada. And uh, so I went, went to Toronto. First time I flew and all of that. And everything went well. And I was nervous, but I had the time of my life. And... And um, I met Lisa Langmois, the Canadian actress, and Leslie Donaldson was there, who has also been on my show a couple times. And I show up there, and there was a nice array of really, really cool artists there. And among them, of course, uh, uh, Su- how do I, I don't want to pronounce her name wrong. Uh, Suzanne uh, Dishrusher? Or Tarachter? Uh, I, I would like to say Suzanne Romero. <laughs> okay, Romero. Oh, I hate, I hate mispronouncing people's names, you know, but... Anyway, uh, Suzanne was there with the little George Romero dolls, and, and oh. oh yeah, and somebody had told me I I um I don't know I think it might have been John Harrison said that uh, Miss Romero is here, and so I walked over and I introduced myself, shook her hand, and and she uh, gave me her information, said she'd do a. a a tribute interview on in honor of George, and it was actually my 200th episode on here. I had her on just in January, and uh, had a nice little chat. I did not know George Romero uh, was dual citizen. I did not know that, so what an honor for us Canadians. Oh, I, you know what? I didn't know that either, Greg. Oh, yeah. You've just given me something, a, a brand new piece of information. I had no idea. Well, George George was living in Toronto whenever he passed away. Oh, yeah. yeah. He loved, loved, loved Canada. Well, you know, I, I wish, wish I don't know whether he made any of his Living Dead movies. I actually, Land of the Dead might have been made up here. I'm not sure, but uh, I know he definitely, definitely never uh, left the Living Dead. <laughs> he had that staple tomb for the rest of his career, but it worked for him. Well, and he was able to reach out, do things like Martin, yep. several other films. But you're right, the Dead series, if we can call it that, mm-hmm. really stuck with him. And it, it all began with that little Pittsburgh film, Night of the Living Dead. Yes, and uh, yeah, he's had quite the career. You mentioned Martin, yes, absolutely. And that, that was, I think, the film that connected him with Tom Savini, who went on to do uh, Dawn of the Dead with him, you know. And and a lot of people, and i got to say, uh, Dawn of the Dead and Night of the Living Dead are pretty much on par with each other in terms of their effect, you, you know. And uh, d- did you see Dawn of the Dead? Yes. I, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I am not... I, I, I was not born as a horror fan to begin with. I was so frightened by a film called The House of Wax. Okay, I know that one. 3D with Vincent Price mm-hmm. when I was about seven years old. Uh, it scared me so badly, Greg, that I, I didn't really want to watch horror films. But getting involved with Night, of course, put me right in the midst of the, the horror genre. So I, I must say, I, I haven't seen as many of the horror films <laughs> as there are out there, but I am very, very respectful of the genre. Oh, absolutely. Well, the, the Living Dead, like, you look at, like, The Walking Dead that's very popular. Like, oh, all yeah. of that started with Romero. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, Greg Nicotero, one of the executive producer writers on that show, has a long history, or had a long history, with George Romero. Mm-hmm. I have seen Greg at quite a few conventions over the years. He has said to me, we need to get you on the show, Walking Dead. I said, Greg, that would be great. If you have a little cameo, whatever, that, that would be lovely. Because so many fans have come up to me and also to Greg and said, Night of the Living Dead started you guys. 
Why yep. don't you have a little cameo there for Jude, or one for Russ, or whatever? Yeah. I, mean, I, 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 there's a story behind that as well. Or, I was called by Greg. He said, "There's a part. This was last year. Mm-hmm. There's a part I really think you'd be great for. I'd like you to audition for it." Okay. What I did because I am living in Arizona now. Mm-hmm. He sent me the sides for it. I memorized it within a few hours. Made reservations to fly in Burbank, where they were going to do the audition. Okay. I laid down a video. They didn't even want more than one. I guess I didn't make a mistake with the lines. But they took that video, sent it on to Atlanta, where they filmed the show. And I was so excited. I had my fingers crossed, hoping, won't this be fun? Well, you know the vagaries of the industry. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Things don't always turn out quite the way you want them. And uh, maybe my eyes were too blue or my hair was too gray. But whatever the reason, I didn't quite make the cut. So to this day, (laughs) you're not going to see me on The Walking Dead unless a miracle happens. Oh, well, that's kind of a a kick to the shins to the fans, I think. (laughs) Well, the fans have been absolutely so supportive. Yeah. Saying how much they'd love to see that. I think it would be a hoot to to do it. Maybe, Maybe one day before the series totally ends. I don't know if this is the last... Uh, the last of the the series or not this year? Do you know? I don't know. I I stopped watching on uh, series series three because they they killed off two of the lovely women in that episode or in that season. And I'm like, look, don't don't. I know people want to see zombies, but don't kill off all the cute girls. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Greg, <laughs> you're letting your feelings show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they got rid of uh, Lauren Hall- Holland and, and Sarah Wayne Callies, both the same season. I'm like, okay, if I watch any more, they're going to get rid of uh, Lauren Cohen next. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want that to happen. <laughs> that Louise, that bat with the barbed wire on it was pretty vicious. That's yeah. <laughs> A lot of people you didn't see would go. Yeah. Well, it's had, had quite a successful run. Yes, it has, you know. But um, I remember uh, seeing films like Night of the Living Dead growing up, and they would terrify me, you know. And, uh, you know, it's kind of funny because Sam Kennison, the comedian, made a joke, you know. And I think it's kind of funny because, you know, in the Bible, Jesus comes back from the dead, you know, and nobody, nobody's frightened. But uh, anything else comes back from the dead, people are terrified. <laughs> No one has ever brought up that comparison, Greg. I don't quite know what to say to it. Well, Sam Kennison brought that up uh, in one of his comedic runs. And, uh, yeah, you know, uh, but I mean, even uh, in the Bible, uh, doubt, uh, uh, Doubting Thomas uh, wanted to touch the nails and the feel his side to know that was really him, you know. And, and uh, of course, in these Living Dead movies, uh, we don't want to touch them. <laughs> want to stay fairly much away from it. Yeah. Well, you say that you were scared by some of those. Well, back growing 19, up, yeah. Back, back in 1968, when Night of the Living Dead came out, it, it showed things that were never seen before. Yeah. The storyline had not been seen before mm-hmm. in a, a, a horror film or any other film. You had a black man, the white woman, yep. doing their best to survive. Nobody said anything about race in the film. It was survival mm-hmm. right from the get-go. The fact that all of us died in the end did not happen in filmmaking back then. No. Night of the Living Dead really set some new boundaries for horror filmmaking. I truly believe that that's one of the reasons we're still around in so many people's minds. Yes. Actually, it's interesting you mention that because uh, um, Dawn of the Dead also 
had the the African American hero and uh, the the female heroine as well, the white female heroine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I that I just dawned on me, and I don't know why I didn't make that connection till now. But <laughs> what's interesting, also, Bragg, maybe you already know this story. You stop me if you do. Mm-hmm. When we were, when George, Russ, and Jack were casting the show, the the part of Ben was not written for a black man. Okay, it wasn't called out in the script. Okay. Wayne Jones, who was a wonderful actor in New York City and had relatives and uh, was very familiar with Pittsburgh, happened to be in town at the time of audition and whatnot. Someone said, you really need to see this guy. He, he would be great. Wow. Wayne auditioned. He was great. In fact, he was the best audition for the part of Ben that George saw. That was all that George needed. Dwayne got the part. It didn't matter if he was black or white or purple. And that's one of the things I love about our film. Yeah, I like that too. And I gotta say, it, uh, Dwayne Jones in the film, I, I love it when he first shows up because he gets there's that close up of him, and you and you you're so much in shock you don't know whether he's a zombie or not. But until he comes in and speaks, you know, uh, you're in shock, and he's just going around and around and around and and uh, boarding the place up. And very very resourceful Ben was, you know, and uh, he had a lot in his hand because you were so shocked you couldn't really move, which is understandable. And uh, but he kept everything together and he had to maintain order when Carl was going a little off the deep end and you know and I really liked Dwayne in the movie I thought he was fantastic good I'm so so happy to hear that I think that that's one of the 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 most important reasons the film has had such a legacy I also think that the storyline of the film even to this day is still strong enough to carry young viewers. Mm-hmm. What's exciting to me about that is oftentimes going to a convention, I have the opportunity of speaking to so many wonderful fans. Many, many of them, Greg, are under 30. I have had some of the finest, deepest conversations with young horror fans. Wow. About Night of the Living Dead. They don't have to be in their 60s or 70s. Here are young people who see something in that film that even with all the technological advances, with all the special effects that can be done now, they see something in our film that has kept them interested. I just... And that's one of the things I love about going to conventions. The conversations yep. that I have with such a wide variety, especially in age, about the film. Yes. <coughs> you, know, you know what? i got to say something else that stands out to me with this film, too. And, and even Dawn of the Dead didn't do this. And I really, for some weird reason, I just noticed it for the first time when watching it before this interview was where you you and your brother are first attacked at the beginning of the film and you're in the vehicle trying to get away trying to get away you don't have the keys in there so you can only coast away and the, the zombies coming after you I like the fact that he's um, he's not going real slow but he's not going real fast either but he catches up to the car and he's pushing uh, slamming his palms against the windows and stuff and finally he goes over and he grabs a rock and he tries to crack through the window so I like the fact that he's able to think but very primitively you know and uh, I kind of liked that element going into this and I really admired that scene because he wasn't too slow but wasn't too fast because I don't like it when they're too fast either you expect a corpse to be a little slower but I like that scene how it was executed good I'm so glad 
you have just paid great homage to Bill Heinzman, who played that zombie. I always call Bill zombie number one. Yeah. <laughs> he, he began the legacy. It was his characterization of basically slow moving, but still resourceful. Yep. The fact that, in fact, that was a very frightening thing for me to do. Being in that car, mm -hmm. Bill taking the rock and smashing that window. Yep. It really uh, got my blood going. Yeah, I I really liked that scene and. And um, he he was moving just gr gradually, you know, but it was realistic, you know, because I noticed, like in Dawn of the Dead, I didn't notice that they were really, you, you could see them turn if they saw something they wanted to eat, but uh, you never seen them pick up something to, to use to smash glass or something like that. And I kind of noticed that there with the scene with Bill. I was like, okay, uh I, I, I like this element of the film, and it really, just the way George shot it, uh, you know, the cuts and whatnot, it, it added a lot of tension to it. This is one of the major reasons, among so many, I believe, that has made George such a standout in the industry, mm -hmm. to give him the reputation he has. George was so creative. He shot every, practically every foot of that film himself. Uh, I think the only thing he didn't shoot was the, the helicopter sequence, when you saw the, the shots from the helicopter down below and watching the, the, the posse coming across. I don't think he liked to show up in the helicopter. <laughs> but that aside, George's creativity when it came to lighting when it came to the direction of the shot the choreography of mm -hmm. the shot yeah i still to this day will watch some of my favorite shots in that movie one of which is the shot of barbara touching the, the button on the top of the little music box the little doors open for just a brief... Oh, I love that, yeah. Hang on a second. You see her eyes, and then the doors close. Yeah. Oh, come on. Now, that, that I, I think, is just a perfect example. Oh, of yeah, it's like... talent and creativity. It's like she's trying to find life somewhere, you know, the music box, you know? Well, he could take a piece of cardboard, rip it into pieces put it up on a gobo stick or whatever they call it, have a light behind it, and bingo, the shadow is created in that scene as we were filming, just lend so much to the emotion of the scene, too. I'm, I'm glad that you, you see these things. Oh, yeah. Well, George, uh, I, I'm, I was told by uh, Suzanne when he showed up at conventions, he, of course, wear the thick black glasses and he had the, uh, the gray hair and the gray beard, you know. But he said when he was out on his own, you know, he didn't have the glasses on, you know. But, but I understand, <laughs> yeah, that was kind of his look, I guess. As we grow older, we we need maybe a little more visual help. <laughs> I think down the down the way, George picked up those big, thick, dark frames, and they became an integral part of who he was. Oh yeah, like even the the dolls that uh, that Suzanne had, even even had the, even had the glasses. So <laughs> absolutely. Do you have a George Romero doll? I don't have a George Romero doll, but I, the same people who made that doll made the very first issue of Barbara. Oh, I, I didn't know there that. was one. There was. Yeah, I have that one here at the house. I love it. Oh, wow. I yes. had no idea. Creepy and Cute is the name of the outfit. you got to check them out online. They are just wonderful. Uh, I was thrilled when they came to my table presented me with the Barbara doll. Just, so it has a place of honor in my home. Oh, wow. The company's called Creepy and Cute. Cute and Creepy. I oh, think. Cute and Creepy. Oh, wow. i got to look that up. Yes. Yes. 
Well, during your scenes, like you had a lot of frightening scenes in the movies, especially when the zombies are starting to break through the the house there at that in the climax, and you and finally you have to help Dwayne board the thing up, you know, and you can see all the hands coming in, you know. I gotta say, what was the most difficult scene for you to shoot in that movie? Wow, most difficult. I I don't know if I'd use difficult. Okay. To describe, there there many of those scenes were quite emotional for me. Okay. Two that stand out in my mind. The first is at the near the very beginning of the film when Barbara is telling Ben what happened to her. Yeah. That was all ad lib. We didn't have dialogue written in the script. George told us, I, I, I want to hear the story of what happened. Make sure you, you add something about the candy or what happened in the car. He gave us little little ideas but then left it up to us and this was for Dwayne as well playing Ben he left it up to us to improvise those scenes about what happened to us in the film that was extremely emotional for me I I remember when we filmed it when we cut Gary Stranger, who was running sound, said, I don't know if I got all that. We may have to do it again. We did it a second time. Of course, you do it a second time, and it's never quite like the first time or the fifth time, whatever. Fortunately, Gary did get the sound for that very first tape. What you see in the movie is that first of okay. the story of what happened. That was scene number one that comes to mind. Scene okay. number two is what you were just talking about a moment ago when all the zombies were breaking into the home. And of course, we didn't call them zombies back then. We called them ghouls. Mm-hmm. As those ghouls were breaking into the house, when Johnny's hand, gloved hand, came around that door frame, pulled me out, being pulled out amongst 20, whatever they were, whatever number, Mm -hmm. and having all those people pawing at you was truly a terrifying scene for me to do. Those Mm -hmm. two stand out. Yeah, it's kind of like... you You know, another one. Okay. At the very beginning of the film, when zombie number do- number one, Bill Heinzman, grabbed me in the cemetery. Bill was so relentless and so in to what he was doing, it, it, you couldn't help but be frightened. And believe me, I was. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, of course you, you know, some of the names escape me here. I forget the name of the actor who played your brother. Russell Strymer. Russell Strymer. Of course, I like the fact, and, and I look at the Rocky Horror Picture Show this way. They 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 always have what they look what looks like the male lead. They always have the glasses, you know, and they're they're uh, looks kind of prime and proper. But when he shows up, he uh, and gets taunting you, he comes off as kind of a juvenile, like he's the one that slept in too late, you know, and he's constantly complaining while you're trying to show your respects to to the to the your father and uh <laughs> remember he's my brother mm-hmm. brothers tend to do that to sisters <laughs> so it didn't surprise me very much <laughs> yeah and of course but whenever uh the zombie number one starts attacking you he does come into action and tries to well, it gives you some leeway, but of course he falls and he hits his head on that tombstone, and uh, you know it's all over from there. And uh, but what what were your memories of him? Oh, well, 
Russ and I see each other. In fact, we just talked last night at a, a Night of the Living Dead meeting. We had a shareholders meeting. I've I've seen Russ quite often over the last few years. We attend, we have attended quite a few horror conventions together. Mm -hmm. We have a wonderful, wonderful time. Here we are both in our 70s now. How different than being in your 20s doing the film. But we have a, a great time. Russ is a very intelligent fella, well-spoken and funny as heck. <laughs> when we get together with our tables side by side, the banter that goes on <laughs> between brother and sister, <laughs> it, it just makes it so much fun for us. I should see. Uh, I should reach out to him and see if he'd come on here too. I think that would be uh, brilliant for the film's fiftieth anniversary. Oh, I, he would love to do that. I, I'm speaking, of course, for him, and I, I don't mean to do that. But do reach out to him. You'll find his email online, whatever. But I'm sure that he would certainly be willing to say a few words to you. Sure, yes, I, I'll definitely do that. But I, I, I love that even though he's only in that uh, beginning moment there uh, doing dialogue, he certainly, he, he's got that line that everybody remembers, they're coming to get you, Barbara. That's right, and he put that wonderful little English tone to it that yeah. everybody seems to love. Yeah. Well, you kind of got to wonder. I sit back and I, as I was watching that scene, I was like, if they'd only showed up maybe an hour early, maybe they could have avoided this somewhat, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's pretty much etched in time now, and no changes can be made. <laughs> well, I think of the same thing when I watched the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I'm sitting here thinking, could this have been avoided? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they were also they were also going to a grave site. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, don't go so late in the day. <laughs> there is a commercial I know you've seen it, where young people are, are running to get away from horrible things. One of them says, "Go into the barn," and, or go, and it's full of knives and things that are hanging on the walls. Places you should never go. Someone says, well, why don't we just take the car that's running right out front? Nobody says, what? Are you crazy? <laughs> so you're right. If only things had been done a little bit differently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, of course, you get there to the house. And I love those moments where you're by yourself. You're trying to uh, get the phone to work, and the phone's not working. You slowly creep upstairs, and you see that corpse are laying with the eye staring, and you know, it, it, it's and you look out the window and you can see Bill and you can see other zombies approaching and it's really creepy, especially in black and white. And then Dwayne shows up and then eventually, uh, you know, you've got other folks that are hiding in the basement. <laughs> but um, that, the storyline really does progress, doesn't it? it there's not a, a quiet moment in it. Maybe the, the one little scene between Judy Ridley and uh, Tom, her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. uh, but the movie really speeds along rather quickly once that attack happens. That's yeah. one of the things, again, I love about the film. Absolutely. i got to say, too, let's, let's talk about... Uh, Another Judith, Judith Ridley, for a minute, of course, played the girlfriend of Tom. And uh, Romero actually used her in his follow-up film. And right now I'm rattling around my papers trying to figure out what that film was. And I can't remember. I had it in my notes when I interviewed Suzanne. But but uh, he did quite a different film after <clears throat> Night of the Living Dead and had Judith in that. And um, she, of course, was one of these free-spirited girls who... In the, uh, the heat of the moment, had to go out and assist her boyfriend. And um, I don't know. I think it was a matter of she could sense danger or she just wanted to be with him. And if she was going to die, she would prefer to be with him uh, rather than be without him. Does that, that make sense, huh? Oh, absolutely. In fact, Judy Ridley, just a, a, 
she's a beautiful woman now. She was just a beautiful young lady back then. I think that George had hoped maybe she would be Barbara. Oh? So I, I, for whatever reasons, only George could tell you, but I'm sure glad that she got the love interest and, and I got the whatever interest. <laughs> 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 I like the way it turned out. Yeah. In fact, I will be seeing Judy very shortly. She will be in Pasadena at the Crypticon convention. We'll have a, a lovely reunion there. I actually looked her up online and couldn't find any information on her, but if you would like to pass my email on to her, my, my, my Excel information, I'd be more than happy to have her on. But she is one crackerjack of a gal. She's rather a, a homebody. Mm -hmm. she, she really doesn't go out of her way to uh, get involved in a lot of these things. It's just the way she's been over the years. But we have had a wonderful time at the few conventions we've shared. She will also be going off to Manchester, England, to appear in the Weekend of the Dead. That's a Marcus Lewis production with his family. Okay. Okay. So, uh, I will I will mention our interview, and we'll see if she gives you a, a jingle. Yeah, I just mentioned I had you and Suzanne on here, and, well, <coughs> I think it'll be pleasant. So <laughs> I, I like to ha I like to have – I've had a lot of guests come on here through other people that's like doing the show. So, you know, I like to give that off because sometimes, you know, you can take chances going on a podcast. So, uh you know, I, I like this. I like the, like going back to the midnight crowd. I like to celebrate the uh, the audience that that it's more than just watching a movie. It's something they get involved with, you know, and an experience, an event, you know. There is a, a story I remember way back when I was living in California. I had my two young children. One, my son came up to me one day and said, Mom, they are showing Night of the Living Dead at the Wilshire Theater, which was just up the street from where we lived. Okay. He said, can we go? This is at the, the big theater. I said, well, sure, let, let's go. We got to the theater. My children ran up and said, my mom is, was in that show. <laughs> they, they let us in. I don't think I even had to pay. That was lovely. Mm -hmm. We sat down. At that time, smoking was allowed in the theater. <laughs> Not only smoking cigarettes, but there was weed being <laughs> smoked in that theater. There I was with my two young children. That theater was full of weed smoke. They were having, they meaning the audience, was having a wonderful time making comments <laughs> they found out that I happened to be there with my family. Well, we just had the best evening <laughs> among all that marijuana smoke. <laughs> <laughs> what did your children think when they first learned that you had done this iconic film? Oh, that's a question you really have to place to them. But <laughs> I, I think... I'm their mom. I'm always going to be their mom, uh, and that takes precedence. Mm -hmm. Well, you're you're etched in film history, so that's a, that's a big thing right there. Like this film is, to put the pun there, never going to die. <laughs> <laughs> that is quite a pun. Yeah. I, my my son is quite knowledgeable about horror films. I really would love to have him travel. To some of these conventions with me he has been to possibly maybe one or two mm -hmm. it's it's been wonderful for me because not only does he help me there but he is able to share so much wonderful horror film information about the stars who were in the film about the film storylines etc things that i'm was that i am not as knowledgeable about i i love to see him interact with the fans okay he, and he's enjoyed it too 
maybe maybe one day we'll be able to do another convention together. Oh yeah. What's your memories of Carl and Miriam? I know we spoke briefly about them earlier, but uh, any more anti Marilyn, Marilyn Eastman and Carl. Okay. Were, yeah, they just just great. They had their partnership in Hardman Associates, where mm-hmm. they worked every day together, doing recordings, commercials, voiceover work. They've worked quite closely. They they were together all those years. Never married, but they were always together, as I recall. Mm-hmm. We had great times. Great times. I am so grateful for the Hardman Associate part of my life, but thoroughly grateful for the experience with both of them on screen in the movie. Yeah. Carl, of course, kind of the antagonist. And, you know, it was nice because he provided that little bit of tension, like when he didn't want to let uh, Dwayne back in, you know. And, and of course, uh, Eastman there had that very tense scene where her little girl's about to use a sharp object on her, you know. And I loved how George Romero shot that, has uh, the shot of the little girl with the, the blade and bringing it down, and then you get the shot of her face, you know, and... Exactly. Mm-hmm. To this day, that scene, that killing, yep. is one of the most disturbing killings on screen that I've ever seen. Yes. You you don't see that cement trial going into her chest. You just see her expression. and You see the splash of blood. You hear the sound effect for it. I totally agree with you, George shot that brilliantly. Yeah, and of course, one of the first shots in The Walking Dead is you see a zombie child. And it's like, you know, George Romero brought that up too, like a zombie child in the movie, you know? Um, Because, of course... When you look back on the early days of Walking Dead, Mm -hmm. Greg and some of the others producing, directing, paid homage I believe, to Night of the Living Dead. Mm-hmm. Wasn't there a child named Judith? Uh, Judith being my name, some people have said, I think they used that because of your character. Oh, I think so, yes. Yeah, so th- there are connections that we have had over the years between Walking Dead and the Night. Wow. They, they'd they be smart to get you and Russ uh, to both do a uh, cameo together in it. <laughs> It would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> and as I had mentioned, um, um, actually, I should mention this going back to the zombie girl. And again, the name escapes me, this girl. But <clears throat> what Kyra was it? Shone what was is the name? The name Kyra. Kyla. Shone now, played the role of Karen. Interestingly, Kyra was Carl Hardman's daughter in real life. Oh, okay. That I did not know that. Yeah. What was this experience like for her? You'd have to get her on the air. <laughs> she'd, she'd have wonderful tales. I bet. Well, it's so creepy because, you, you know, I guess she was bit by one of them. And, of course, you know that's not going to turn out well. I mean, we've, we've seen that again and again in zombie movies. Somebody gets bit, you know they're going to turn into something that's not going to be friendly. <laughs> <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> and, of course, she does look creepy whenever she does emerge, especially uh, doing the gnawing and the chewing, and that is just a creepy image. Kyra's image of her looking up with those the shadows under her eyes, mm-hmm. the hair that's going across her face, that image of Kyra has been used more places throughout this planet than any other image from at least our film. Yes. Hers is an iconic image of a a young zombie or a young ghoul at that time. Kind of makes you wonder if she uses that pick for a driver's license. (laughs) (laughs) If you meet her, you'll love her. Oh, absolutely. Extremely talented artist. 
she taught for many, many years. She taught art in the school district back in uh, Pittsburgh, just outside of Pittsburgh. She has since retired, but she makes the most beautiful jewelry. Oh. A lot has to do with the film and the horror genre, but an extremely talented, sensitive, funny woman. You could never hope to meet. It's just great. Yeah, all well, these few of these people I got to reach out to, especially for the 50th anniversary of the film. But speaking of people I have met, you know, I did meet John Russo at Horrorama, and what a nice man. Still very, very busy. But it's funny because uh, I know I, I just saw one of my interview guests from last year posted a pic on Facebook at a recent event that John Russo was also at. And I, I commented on it. I said, I just met him last November, you know, when he signed a picture of himself as a dead zombie in Night of the Living Dead. And I got, I got that nice proud picture of myself and him on Facebook. <laughs> Good for you. Yes, John not only was in the film, but he was... Again, one of the producers, mm -hmm. as well as I believe he helped in the writing. He helped George with the writing of the, the script. And, and like George, he's, he kind of remained with the, the horror genre throughout his career, but done so very well. It, like I said, it was nice to meet him, you know. Good. I'm glad that you have that chance to meet him. Yeah. And, of course, I met John Harrison. And uh, they, they were screening his movie, Effects, which uh, he did, I, th I think came out in 1980, and it was an early film with Tom Savini as well. And, um, and I met John, and, and um, I bought a copy of Effects, which he had there, and he signed it, and I did a photo with him. John, very, very, very nice man, John Harrison, and I think he was the one that told me that Suzanne was there, you know, and how I got to meet her, because... I was there assisting another guest, but I got a moment where I was able to walk around and met some of these wonderful people. And John Harrison, very well spoken, very, very nice man. It's sort of a six degrees of separation, isn't it? Oh, yeah. You meet one and you'll meet another, and that other knows somebody else, and pretty soon you have a wide, wide network. That's what's been happening with me here on this this podcast. You know, it's... I get talking to one and we connect to another and connect to another and uh, this has been a blast and you know celebrating uh, this film that came out four years before I was born you know and and uh, you know being able to celebrate it and like I said like I can't stand hearing people talk about how they won't watch black and white you know because there's so when, but to me, I agree with Roger Ebert. Sometimes black and white movies can look even better than color films, you know? Oh, I totally agree. It depends upon the storyline. I think Night of the Living Dead is best seen in black and white. I agree. Like any time I've seen a screening of Casablanca, people oh, show yes. up to it. Yeah. I, I have often used them. As an example, mm -hmm. I have said, would you really want to see Casablanca in black or in, in color? It exactly. wouldn't be the same. Nope. No. No, that, that picture is perfect just the way it was made in black and white. And other films like It's a Wonderful Life and Citizen Kane, they all look, and look psycho, you know? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And, of course, in many, many people might say Psycho in many ways and Peeping Tom kind of paved the way for um, horror films going from the, uh, the costume effects to the more uh, edgier tone that they, they, they lately received. And, of course, Night of the Living Dead came out towards the end of the 60s where Psycho kind of began the 60s. Well, you're talking Alfred Hitchcock, mm -hmm. one of the best. Uh, yeah, I had Hitchcock's granddaughter on here a couple of years ago, and that was a pretty delightful conversation because I saw a midnight screening of Psycho back in 1996 at a midnight screening, and it changed the way I look at movies. Well, wonderful. Yeah, because I was stuck in that rant where I didn't want to watch black and white. I didn't want to watch older movies, you know, because I was so caught up in technology. But I attended that screening, and after Psycho, I was like, holy cow, I want to see more of this guy's work. And and through Hitchcock, I was introduced to James Stewart, Cary Grant, and the gorgeous Grace Kelly. 
and I watch some of their movies, and I just just go from there. Good for you. Yeah. Been wonderfully expanded. Yeah, I got to ask. I want, I, I what? I want to thank you for inviting me on. Like somebody's giving me the, the a wave here, saying you got food on the table. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got. I just got a couple. I'm of head downstairs. But, I just, I appreciated our time together. Yeah. I want to thank you for inviting me on. Well, you know what? The pleasure is all mine, and what an honor celebrating the 50th anniversary of this film. I was just wondering if before you go, you do a plug for my show. Hello, this is Judith O'Day from the original George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead. I have joined Greg Gilbert of Python Paradise out of New Brunswick, Canada. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Judith. Thank you for the honor. It is just a thrill to talk to you, and God bless you in the future. Thank you, Greg. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. You take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.